Today's experimental math seminar will be given by Professor Carl Dieter Grisman uh, from Golden College, who will talk about voting on cyclic orders. As usual, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and ask the questions, but otherwise, please mute yourself. Thank you. All right, shall I share the screen? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, to all the hosts, uh, but especially uh, Professor Zeilberger, and that this is a real treat. As I was saying ahead of time, one of my students did a REU at uh, DIMAX a long time ago, and so it's kind of fun to be able to talk to that community. Uh, this is joint work with some undergraduate students uh, who you should all hire or accept to grad school. Uh, and we'll be talking about voting and I'll try to connect it as much to the combinatorial side as possible. And we will have some experimental at the end as well. So I hope that everybody will be happy uh, with something that we do uh, by the end there. But I'm excited to talk to you about it. So the first thing we need to do is talk about uh, voting. So uh, I don't assume that people here necessarily have thought about voting mathematically before. So how, what, what does it mean to think about voting mathematically? So I'm gonna try and be kind of abstract at first. Suppose that when you think about voting, you're just saying, I have some outcomes that I like to try and come up with. And then I also have some ballots that I could use to vote on those. So those might not be the same set. I have some ballots I could submit, and then there could be some outcomes that could result. So what is a voting system if we want to model it mathematically then? If I can get my mouse in the right place, there we go. So here's an example. This, everybody's familiar with this let's suppose you're voting for, let's say, governor or something, then we could say that both the ballots and the outcomes are just the set of candidates. So you submit a ballot that has one candidate on it. And in this case, you would just add up all the ballots and whoever has the most is the candidate that's selected. So both the ballot uh, and the outcome are just the set of candidates. Um, this is, we're all familiar with this, I think. Here's one that maybe is a little less familiar, but I think if you've been paying attention to the news, you'll have some uh, input on. Suppose that the output and the ballots are related, but this time the ballot isn't just the candidates, but it's the set of linear orders. So I'm going to rank all the candidates in a linear order, and that's my ballot. So I have to take all the candidates and do that. And then the outcome, well, you know what? It might not just be the set A. Maybe I need the power set of A, because there might be a tie. Maybe there's a big tie. So you imagine that you submit a ballot that's a linear order, and your outcome is one or more of the candidates. And then you get to pick the procedure, and that's up to you. Uh, you could use various uh, ones. There's one that's been in the news lately that should be called instant runoff, which is misleadingly named uh, ranked choice voting, uh, but there's lots of others that you could pick. So this is how I want to think about uh, voting theory. In particular, for the purposes of this talk, notice that we're really just considering how many people are voting for each of the ballots. It doesn't really matter if I vote for candidate A or if you do. What matters is somebody does. There is one vote for candidate A. So I'm going to uh, think of it a little more concretely then. Let's think of voting as functions from a set of elements of a vector space with kind of a standard basis where there's one for each ballot. Or think of it another way. For each person on the ballot, you get to submit a number. And then our outcome is the power set or just the set of the outcomes. Okay, so we call those profiles. For instance, if uh, three of the people on this call vote for the talk to end at right now and five of the people vote for it to end in 10 minutes, that's, that's a profile. Maybe zero people vote for it to end in 100 minutes. Okay, that's a profile. It's not it's an option. Profile. It's going to end at 40, 48 minutes after. Uh, that's right, 48. That's right, exactly. <laughs> so this is a dictatorship which is also something that we study in math mathematics of voting. Now, here's a different example to get you thinking about these outcomes and ballots. So let's suppose the outcome, we want a two-person committee to organize this seminar series. But what if I said your ballot is any set of three people that is a subset of faculty and graduate students at Rutgers? That might be a weird thing to do, but you could imagine maybe I want to force the voters to come up with more people and not just choose two people, even though we're going to actually choose two people to run the seminar. And again, I don't know if Echad is allowable for this particular uh, set of ballots. But th this is a legitimate voting system that you could use on a committee to organize the seminar series. And there's a lot of work in artificial intelligence community on voting on committees. 
Or here's a different one. Uh, suppose you want to rank all the programming languages that you know of, or that some huge set of programming languages. Well, it's too much to rank all of them, but you could ask everybody on this call to rank their top five. That's a legitimate ballot, but the outcome you might want to be a full linear order of all possible programming languages, okay? So you get to rank five, it's kind of a truncated linear order, but the outcome you might want to be a full linear order. And again, this is the kind of thing that people really do want to use because for realistic purposes, this is actually used for things like the Heisman Trophy, for instance, uh, or for college football polls, uh, where Rutgers should always lose to Northwestern in the Big Ten, of course. So who is, what is voting theory then? If we think about voting theory a little more mathematically, we should think of it as aggregating something that can be interpreted as preferences. So if there's some mathematical object that can be interpreted as meaningful preferences, we want to study the aggregation of those preferences. And the preferences might be different from the outcomes. And you can see, I give a couple examples of why people might care about this. Uh, again, the, the AI community is definitely interested in this, uh, but you could also think of allocation of resources, like teaching resources in the department. Who gets to teach that game theory course? Uh, or, or should we even teach one at all? These are the kinds of aggregation of preferences that you might want to do. So in this talk, what I want to do is first talk about how representation theory connects to this voting. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit. I don't assume representation theory, but you'll just have to assume lots of black boxes if you've never seen representation theory. Then what I'm going to do is introduce a new possible ballot and outcome called cyclic orders. Uh, although they're well-known combinatorially, they haven't been dealt with in this context. And then finally, I wanna discuss some results, including some experimental work that my students did on this. So that's the roadmap. All right, well, let's talk about some representations. So not every voting system can be thought of as a linear transformation. For instance, the so-called ranked choice voting that's now in use in Maine and some other places is not a linear transformation. Uh, but a lot of systems are. If you think of all the ballots, the profiles, as being a Q vector space. And we, we're dealing with Q here just because it's easier than only dealing with positive integers. And it's actually useful in many contexts to have negative or fractional voters allowed, for instance, for proportions. The outcome space, the points, that's definitely a vector space. So we can think of the voting system sometimes as a linear transformation. For instance, the boring plurality method where you just vote for your favorite governor candidate and then you add up the points, that is a linear transformation. In fact, the matrix is the identity matrix, uh, but technically it is a linear transformation and the end result is a vector of points. And then the argmax gives you the winning gubernatorial candidate. Um, and for the purposes of this talk, I'm largely going to conflate the, the linear transformations and then taking the maximum for the winner. Uh, it turns out that that's actually quite useful to do. Here's another one you may not have heard of. Uh, suppose that you can submit any ballot where you just get to mark anybody you want for governor. So if you like five of the seven candidates, great. Mark them all as somebody you want. Then they all get one point, and then you add the points. This is a larger ballot set. Even with three candidates, there's seven or eight, depending on whether you allow the empty ballot. Um, but it still can be thought of as a linear transformation. It's just that now there's eight and then three outcomes as opposed to before. So that, that's still really nice. Again, note that you could have a different ballot than the outcome. That's totally okay. So here's a, an older example. Uh, suppose you're voting for the Holy Roman Emperor uh, and, and the Holy Roman Emperor was an elective position uh, for most of its history. Uh, and suppose that we're going to say, well, how, let, let's rank all the candidates for the Holy Roman Emperor. So let B be the set of all full rankings of all the people who are eligible to be Holy Roman Emperor, maybe the various dukes uh, of that region. So what you're gonna do then is let, let's come up with this system. And this is a system that was proposed historically. Assign one point to the candidate that's your least favorite. Each voter then assigns two points to their second least favorite candidate and they rise up until they reach their favorite candidate. And if there's 10 candidates, that candidate will get 10 points. Now we add up all the points from all the voters. It's not quite as interesting here because there's usually only seven voters, but that's the golden bull comes after this was proposed actually. Uh, and then you just take the argmax again. Here's a simpler version. Uh, we, we don't have 10 candidates, here's three. 
So if you vote for A bigger than B bigger than C, so your preferred emperor is a candidate A and your least preferred is C, then you'll give three points to A, two points to B, and one point to C. Well, if you put these preferences in this order that you can see here, then multiplying this matrix by the profile vector will get you exactly what you want. So for instance, here, there's two people who want A as their favorite emperor and C as their least favorite emperor. And there's nobody who wants B as their favorite emperor and A as their least favorite emperor. So you multiply this matrix by this profile vector and the outcome is candidate A gets 10 points for Holy Roman Emperor and uh, eight and five for the other two. And you can actually do it if you want. And it's not surprising. Three of the voters thought that A was the best candidate for emperor. So it's not surprising that this person wins, um, but there you go. Now this was actually proposed historically by Nicholas Cusanus in the 15th century. Uh, we don't think it was ever used, uh, but he wrote just at some length about it. And there's a great article by Reagan Vetter about this. Um, Jean-Charles Borda, completely independently came up with this uh, around the time of the French Revolution. And oh, so it's so it really called because, the Borda count. It's really because the Cousin was count. It, it, the well, count. but you know, according to Stigler's law, everything is named after yeah. the wrong person, including yeah. Stigler's law. So, yeah. you know, what, what are you going to do? You might have used a similar system if you voted in a professional society, maybe in some university committee, or for the Eurovision Song Contest. Uh, all of these things use some kind of point space system. Some of them actually use the board account or a truncated board account. Now, the, what's different about this is we're not just talking about the points. If you looked at that matrix, it's very symmetric, highly symmetric. In fact, you can see that there's a symmetry action of S3 on the three candidate names. Now, of course, there is on the set ABC, but we can extend that to an action on the linear orders on ABC. We can also extend it to the outcomes. And then by linearity, we can extend that action to all the profiles. Um, so sorry, I shouldn't go back. I should show you an example. So here's the matrix and here's the example. Here's the profile I had before, 2110001. These two people are voting for A in first place and C in last place. If I apply the permutation AB, now they'll think B is in first place and C is in last place. That was the sixth of the permutations or the linear orders I gave. And so you see this two moves over here to the last entry. Now, if I use the same matrix, because this matrix is so symmetric, the outcome is eight, 10, five instead of 10, eight, five. So not only did we swap A for B as the winner, which you might expect because we applied the symmetry that swaps A and B, but the numbers got swapped too. The five doesn't change. C still gets five points. I didn't do anything to five. So it's not just that we can say there's a symmetry on the profiles and on the votes, but the procedure itself obeys the symmetry. And this is true uh, for any such thing. I just gave one example. So now let's think about this. Is this an important property? It turns out that independently of algebra, this is the property that voting theorists, even since the 50s and Arrow's theorem have come up with as a reasonable fairness property. If, you, if everybody's ballot changes the names of the candidates and then you apply your voting method, that should be the same thing as first you do your vote and then you switch everybody's names. And we call this a neutral procedure. It's an extremely important property in mathematics of voting um, and it, it's, yeah, like, well, several Nobel prizes, right? Uh, including arrows. Uh, so th this is a really important property. But what I like about it is that this property looks an awful lot like an algebraic property, just invariance under a group action. So what do we got here? We got profiles and vote totals that are vector spaces acted on by a group. The function itself is a linear procedure. It's a matrix. and it's invariant under the group action. That's what this line says. Sounds like a representation to me. And that's exactly what these are. These are QSN modules or representations, vector spaces that have a meaningful group action. Further, because the function has this property, it's automatically a QSN module homomorphism. You don't need anything else. 
So all of a sudden we start with voting and we end up with representations. Uh, I was just blown away the first time I saw this in a presentation uh, maybe a dozen years ago now, but it, it, it's really great stuff. Because now I can use all the standard facts about representations. Who, who were the first to find these connections between voting uh, theory and representation that, theory? That's open. I'll, I'll, the short answer is in non-cooperative game theory, there was already some researchers in the 90s who were doing this, um, who were in operations research. Um, the paper Doherty et al., Mike Orison and some of his students were the first ones to explicitly do this, although Don Sari claims that he was always thinking of representations when he was yeah. doing some of his geometric work in the 90s. Yeah. You know, it, it's lost to history in some point. But the first paper to do voting with this is Doherty et al., which I'll reference in a second. Yeah. Um, so here's the two big facts about representations. First of all, any vector space with this SN action decomposes as irreducible subspaces. So a direct sum of these irreducibles. An irreducible one being a subspace where if you get rid of any more vectors, it will no longer have an action. It will no longer be invariant under this thing. It won't make sense under switching the names of candidates. Um, and this is a unique decomposition up to some something. Uh, secondly, once you've got that decomposition, if you have this homomorphism, if you have a map, if the map itself obeys the symmetry, then every irreducible module either is completely killed or it goes isomorphically to its image. And I can't overstate the importance of this because it's, you know, if you have a four dimensional sub vector space, you wouldn't expect that it has to go to either another four dimensional one or to zero, but that's what happens. Uh, and because Q is a splitting field for SN, it turns out we actually uh, have multiplication by a constant here in Schur's lemma. So it, it's a special case, but it's super useful for this case because we don't have to worry about other kinds of isomorphisms. So let's see this actually work. If you have the set of all linear orders and you make your profile space, I'm not going to go into the details. There is a representation called the regular representation, and this is it. For the outcome space, it turns out this is the permutation representation or the sum of the trivial representation and the so-called standard representation. If you haven't seen this before, that's a little uh, abstract, so let's make it more concrete. When we have three candidates, three factorial is six, so there's six possible orders. So I have a six-dimensional vector space that breaks up into this irreducible component, which also shows up in the outcome space. This irreducible component, which you'll notice does not show up in the outcome space, and then two of this irreducible component, but there's only one of those in the outcome space. We can actually give meaningful voting theoretic bases as well. So this S3 space, this trivial space is indeed trivial. If you act on it by any symmetry, you're just shuffling ones around. So nothing happens. More interestingly, uh, an S21 profile vector, and I'm using the spec module notation here, um, Imagine you have a profile where there's one person for every ranking that has A in first place and negative one people for each ranking where A is in last place. I know that sounds kind of weird, negative one people, but that, that is a legitimate profile. In that case, that's one of these S21 vectors. Uh, and in the outcome space, they're similar. Now take a look at this. S111 doesn't even show up in the outcome space. And this uh, sub irreducible subspace, there's two of them, but there's only one in the outcome. That means that it's not just that we have a six dimensional space going down to three dimensions. We expect at least three dimensions of kernel, but we know exactly which piece will die. It's going to be all the S11 and half of the S21 because of Schur's lemma. Again, we can actually have specific voting theoretic interpretations of these. And in particular in this Doherty et al paper, they confirm what Sari had in many papers, that this S11 component is responsible for all the paradoxes when you compare a points-based system to pairwise voting-based systems. So you can't get these paradoxes in methods that involve points like this in these linear systems. Um, also, the board account keeps the most relevant of the two one pieces. And I'm sorry, I don't have time uh, to tell you what I mean by the most relevant, but there is a most relevant way that you can define using voting theory, not algebra. And the board account is the only system that sends none of that to zero. Uh, so there, there's some good interpretations of these spaces. It's not just the algebra, 
It's that it gives us information in voting contexts. So there's your whirlwind tour <laughs> of voting and representations. A, a, a quick yeah. question. So yeah. can you, for general, uh, and can you enumerate uh, how many show up? Yes. So so see see Doherty at all or see my paper from 2014. Uh, there oh. there's there's discussion of these things because it turns out that almost everything dies basically. Oh. So there's it and the stuff most of the stuff that doesn't die should die. So it's oh. yeah. It turns out that there's some very nice results along those lines. But that's not the point of this talk. Okay. The point of this talk is to vote on something new. So. In order to introduce this new thing, I want you to imagine a different setting. Okay, we're not voting for a Holy Roman Emperor or anything like that. We're just watching some people play poker. So here are some poker players, or well, actually, it's me and my students. Uh, but you know, here's our avatars. Imagine that we're playing poker, um, and this is a game that's both skill and chance, right? There is skill, but there's also chance involved, obviously. So the, any one round of a poker, um, you know game match is, you know, there's gonna be a lot of chance, but over the long run, it's not really gonna matter so much. Everybody will get to be dealer many times. Everybody's gonna be first to bid many times. So it really what matters in the long run is how you're seated around the table. So you can imagine here, if Josephine is the, uh, the, the person who's dealing this first time, then I'm dealing the second time. If we only play two rounds, that's important. But if we play dozens of rounds, What's really important is that Josephine comes before me and I bid before Abraham and he bids before Micah and Micah bids before Josephine. The long run, these two orders with two different dealers should be equivalent because it's, we're just doing so many times. What's really important is who am I next to? Who am I bidding right after or right before or who bids a long time away from me? So we can actually define uh, this formally. Suppose you take the set of permutations of some finite set, but under this equivalence relation, the equivalence relation, it's a right action of the cyclic group where you take A, B, C, D and identify that with B, C, D, A. So we're not just saying they're related, they're literally identified. Then the set of equivalence classes is called the set of cyclic orders. Um, in some of the, you guys are combinatorialists, the literature, sometimes cyclic orders are called partial. These are total cyclic orders. Um, I just call them cyclic orders. There's clearly n minus one factorial of these. I give you some notation. So let's see what that looks like with my you know, poker players. Here we got six different orders and that's it. There's only six of them, but you'll notice there isn't an obvious connection to three factorial. It's really four minus one factorial because we have this identification. All right, so uh, we got people playing poker. But now imagine that there's people watching us play poker and they're betting on who wins. They might want to change what order we're sitting in order to make it advantageous for the person they want to win, right? So if Stoyan really wants me to win, he might not want to put me next to uh, you know, Abraham because Abraham's really good at card games. Okay, so he might actually want to put me opposite Abraham, like in these, this one here. All right, well, what if these spectators could vote on the order? I don't think that that ever happens, although that you can actually bet, this is kind of sad, you can bet on the winner of the World Series of Poker. I don't, I don't even know what to make of this, but, but you can imagine something else. What about voting on orders that classes are uh, organized in a two semester rotation, four semester rotation? You, if you don't wanna think about poker. So here's the cyclic orders a little more abstractly. Now there's no more weird avatars. You'll notice I've ordered them so that the ones that have A across from B are first, and then the ones who have A across from C, uh, and then the ones that have A across from D. Uh, so I'm trying to keep them in some sort of useful order, uh, and we'll keep that order as we go through. So there's a lot of possible ballots, but I think the easiest ballot you could use is just to say to every single voter, all right, pick your favorite. But now it's not like voting for the governor because there's structure inside the things. There's no structure between candidates for governor, but you could do something like these. Let's give one point to your favorite cyclic order and also give one point to the reversal. And you can see what I mean by reversal here. I'm going the other way around the table. If you don't care what order it goes in, just who you're next to, maybe that's Thanksgiving dinner. Okay, 
And that's pretty reasonable. On the other hand, you could also have this one. Maybe you really think direction matters. Then you get a point for your cyclic order and you're gonna give a negative point to the reversal. I don't care about the other ones, but I really wanna make sure that I get a negative point for that reversal because I don't want that. Or here's another one. Give two points for your favorite and then one point for the reversal. So order matters, adjacency matters. If you have both of them, then you're really happy. These are all just possibility. Well, now I can do the same thing. These are all points. And just like with the points in the board account, I can organize these points into a matrix, one for each ballot. Then I can once again represent a profile as a column vector. So here I have two people, two people, I'm trying to just highlight the number two and it's not letting me, there we go. Two people who vote for this order around the table. And again, think of it as A comes after D. So we're going, you know, A, C, B, D, and then A repeats. Uh, and then nobody is voting for the following order. Nobody's voting for A, B, D, C. Then I just multiply, get the point totals. Whoever has the most is the winning order. Here's an example. This is from the last, uh, the last suggestion I gave. Two points for your favorite, one point for its reversal. The same uh, vector that I just kind of randomly came up with. Uh, and you can see it's random because the outcome isn't very interesting. Uh, but I just want to show you that it's possible to do this matrix computation and it really gives you something useful. Okay, you know, ACBD wins. Uh, and not by as much as the number of people who uh, preferred it because both of these people look prefer for A to be across from B. Uh, and so that influences it. So one of those is getting lots of points. So basically I'm just doing exactly the same thing I did before, but with a different outcome and ballot space. Instead of people and rankings of people, I have these cyclic orders and how many people are, you know, or I guess the rankings of the cyclic orders. And there's also an action. It's a different action. So you can see this with n equals three. I wanna make it really clear. The permutation ABC does not change this cyclic order at all. It changes a permutation, but the cyclic order does not actually change. But if I use AB, I hope you can see that if I apply that to this, then this becomes BACB, here it is. And that's the same cyclic order. It's in the same equivalence class as ACBA. And that's different, that's, that's the opposite. So if I have three people at the Thanksgiving table, I got to do it the other way around. Or maybe this is a better one for poker. It's the exact opposite direction. Well, what would representation theory tell us? I'm only going to show you n equals four, uh, again, for the sake of time. This space decomposes into three irreducible subspaces. And for those who know, which I think probably almost everybody on the call does, uh, here's the actual decomposition. So I'm not every... A uh, possible irreducible over S4 is showing up. I've got a trivial subspace where I have one voter for every possible order. I have this three dimensional subspace. This is really interesting. Each of the basis vectors has one person voting for an order and minus one people voting for its opposite. So there's three of those. So it's a three dimensional subspace. Finally, V is a two-dimensional span of these three very symmetric vectors. This is one where I have two people voting for each of the orders where A is across the table from B, and then the other ones get minus one points. And why am I doing minus one points? Because I want it to be some zero, because it has to be orthogonal to the trivial component. And that's it. And that's both the ballot space and the outcome space, right? Your ballot is, I'm picking one of these orders around the table, and the outcome is I'm picking an order around the table. So T has to go to T by Schur's lemma. U has to go to U. B has to go to B by multiplication. So we just need three parameters. And so we can make the matrix. Every matrix has to look like this. Now you might've said, well, I could have figured that out without representation theory. And you're absolutely right. My students were able to figure this out without representation theory. But what you harder to do without representation theory is to say exactly what the profiles look like to go to zero. So here's two little facts that we uncovered. Here's the kernels, and they can be quite different. Uh, for n equals five, it actually gets interesting, but we're going to have to skip that slide for now, uh, again, just for the sake of time. Uh, I do have them at the end if people want to see them, so uh, I kept them alive. But this is what we can do. 
And for the n equals five case, you definitely do want representation theory. Trying to do it by hand, by just ad hoc methods is a nightmare. You're, you're, you're gonna miss irreducible subspaces. And hence, you're gonna get the wrong matrix. Now I promised experimental math. So I have to introduce a different ballot on this. I got some voting, I got some algebra, I got some cyclic orders, I have voted on those. I haven't really done anything experimental. I, I actually, that's kind of a lie because when we found the bases, especially for n equals five, there was actually a lot of experimenting that had to be done to figure out which ones are meaningful, which ones actually generated the subspaces. It, but it may, maybe that's not what we mean by, I don't know. It was definitely computer aided, let's put it that way. Here's where the experimenting comes in. Suppose you have a more complex ballot. Instead of just voting for your favorite, what if you're allowed to submit a ballot with more information, but not a full ranking? Because that's already, there's six factorial of those. That's way too many. But what you might want to do is say, well, let's say that I want, you know, Josephine to win. Do I really want to have me come immediately after her and Micah come immediately before her? It turns out you want to have a weak player on your left. And there is a strategy here. Uh, like you can look this thing up if you care about poker and a stronger player on your right. So it'd be reasonable for a ballot to look like this. You don't care who's far away from your favorite, but if you want player A to win, then you want to put a strong player right before him and a weak player right after him. So a ballot that has those three pieces of information could be a really useful ballot. Well, there's 24 of these ballots and we call them Rolo ballots for right of, left of. So for instance, this one here, A is the one I want to win. I want D immediately before it and C immediately after it. That's a 24 dimensional space. Now the outcome, we still need a cyclic order. People are playing poker. So you gotta just let them play poker. But now there's a 24 dimensional space going down to a six dimensional space. Okay, so that's 18 dimensions worth of kernel. Well, which ones are they gonna be? Well, first we have to come up with a system. So here's a system. Take a ballot, give two points to the one, in this case, there's a unique one uh, that corresponds to it. And then give one point to each of the ballots that have one of the things. Here, the weak player is coming after me. And here, the strong player D is, is coming before A. So don't give them two points, you can give those one points each. We call this the Rolo 2 one procedure. So here's the matrix. I take a 24 dimensional thing, multiply by this matrix, and now I can get all the same kind of decomposition theorems that I was just showing you. Um, and in my talk for the joint math meetings for the voting theory people, we talked a lot about that. But this is the experimental math seminar. So I wanna talk about something different because in some sense, who cares about the kernel? The kernel is almost guaranteed to have negative voters. And you know what? We probably don't have actual virtual voters or negative voters. Instead, we probably wanna look at non-negative integer profiles. The symmetric nature of this matrix, it's easy to find some things that give you a complete tie. Uh, but to be comprehensive about it, it's not so easy because we don't know how many voters we're gonna to need to get every single possibility. I would say representation theory can't directly address this. And that was great for my students because they didn't know what groups were. So in order for them to do this, they couldn't use representation theory. They had one linear algebra class and then they just started doing this, but they could still look at the patterns. So here's what they did. Here's a generation of every distinct six voter complete tie. So if you have six people voting, and they each pick one of these Rolo ballots. This is actually for a slightly different system called TRAD, but don't worry about that. If there, it turned out there were 296 unique ones. And then they started saying, once I've generated these, how do I organize them? What kind of patterns am I going to find? Uh, we use the Sage math system on the CoCal platform in order to do it. I highly recommend it because Sage is awesome. So here's one thing that they did. Let's organize the data by the permutations. And you can see there's actual group actions following these lines around. These are swaps of different names of candidates. They didn't know they were groups, but they did know how to swap things and permute. What's another way to organize? Graphically. So here we have three different types of combinations. If A is across from C and D is next to C, then if you take these two things together, it turns out you get not a complete six-way tie, but you get a partial tie. 
So if you take one from each of these categories, you get a complete six-way tie. They came up with this. I didn't come up with this strategy. And then they're able to represent that on the cube octahedron. There's no representation theory here, right? But it's really cool. They were able to graphically demonstrate here's where all these six-dimensional or six-way ties are going to come from. But it turned out that wasn't all the six-way ties. These were the three complements, these 64 possible ties, which had a total dimension of uh, 10. And then there were these other way to get ties. And then there were these other ones that didn't even fit in any of the categories, but they just found them. We can look at the dimensionality of the vector spaces generated by these and see, does it come up with everything? So for instance, here we have seven dimensions that work out. In the representation theory context, it turns out that these are numbers that must show up because we end up with some three-dimensional, some uh, two-dimensional, some one-dimensional irreducibles. Uh, so that it turns out it all adds up. But like there's three dimensions over here that are really weird three dimensions that we wouldn't expect to be in ties. And unfortunately, with the experimental stuff, that's kind of where we stayed. Uh, this next student that I had, uh, he actually did know both group theory and linear algebra. So we were able to do a lot with representations there. Um, so this is where we would like to continue looking. What form must all complete ties take? This is just with six voters. How else could you get a complete tie? What kind of structure would show up? And I would imagine they'd be quite combinatorial and not at all representation theoretic. Um, so this is, I think, really interesting. And it's not hard to generate these, um, but they sure had a lot of fun doing it. And it was really sad that they had to stop at the end of the summer because then they had classes again. Um, but we had a really, it, it was during the main COVID. I still can't believe I did an REU during the main lockdown, uh, but it, it was pretty fun. So that, that's all we have for today. I really have to thank um, the organizers. It's really a privilege to talk in this uh, well-known seminar. Uh, I have to also thank my students who did an awesome job and who all will go to some kind of graduate school someday, um, but they're still, they're still trying to figure out which ones. Some colleagues who provided some uh, useful comments and thanks to all of you who are listening and did not yet have any questions, which means that either it was too hard or too easy or too boring. So hopefully it was none of those, but thank you for- Now let's unmute yourself and thank uh, Carl Dicker. Uh, one thing was definitely not was not boring. Uh, uh -huh, about, thank you. So really, really was fascinating. But I have a uh, we have plenty of time for questions. So let me be the first one. Uh, so all this uh, partition that show up for n equals four out of the whatever five or whatever partitions uh, or seven. Oh, you want to see the five? Here comes five. All right. So. So can you characterize all the partitions that show up? In, no, in the... not yet. That that I ah. wish I could. I've done ah. experimentation. I've so this is this is also the experimental side. I've done computations out through n equals nine, and other than one subspace that definitely always shows up, one irreducible, which is the uh, the n minus two comma two spec module. Who knows? I think there isn't ah. even an odd. There is an even yeah. odd thing going on. Half of all the profiles, if I go back a little ways, hang on. Half of all the profiles uh, necessarily look like this U. For odd N, I don't know what they look like. For even N, I don't know what they look like. But I know they're different for even N and odd N. How they decompose, I haven't been able to figure out. But I know that they're different for even and odd. There's some kind of thing. Uh, and there's some additional symmetries I didn't talk about. If, once we get to five cyclic orders, I, I don't want to waste everybody's time by saying it, but there are certain cyclic orders that are more unequal than others in a certain very specific sense. There's a certain right action. Um, and it turns out that, that if you use that as well to decompose your irreducibles, then there's more fine grained information that you get, but it also has fewer patterns. Uh, and then here's the matrix. So if you want a big wow. matrix, there you go. Wow. There you go. Wow, your students with a big matrix. And my yeah. student, one of my students, he caught. I thought that there would only be six things in here, but he he yeah. got eight. That's because he actually did the math, and I was just thinking about it. Uh, yeah. And, and then I proved. Then later on, I confirmed that yes, there are eight variables in this wow. matrix. So in principle, you can go a few more uh, 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 sizes, right? You like could. 20 to, 20 I haven't been able to do it algorithmically yet. 
and doing yeah. it by yeah. hand for 120 is yeah, not something yeah. that teaching a three three or four four load really allows me to no, do. Of course not, but it'd be nice to recognize <laughs> it. Yeah. Yes, no, I mean, it can be done, uh, but yeah. it requires you to put a group action on the vectors in the computer algebra system, and I haven't figured out how to do that yet. Ah, I mean, interesting. Yeah. Because they have a group theory packages in SAGE and all. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, but there's there's no, as far as I can tell, there's no way to use either SAGE or GAP in SAGE in order to put a group action on an, a vector space where you define the group action. Ah, ah. Because this is not just a standard, you know, this is just some random vector space. Right. Yeah. It's, it's not like it's, you know, the permutation representation of some well known thing. It's just, here's some vectors. Let me put an action yeah. on it. Um, yeah. So so it's not obvious. So you may want to do it. Uh, to, of to course, I would love to, but again, time. Yeah, yeah it's very interesting. Uh, more questions? Oh, yeah. So if there's nobody else who has a question directly about your talk, forgive me if I ask a question about uh, Donald Starry's uh, point of view about traditional voting situations. So you've got... Oh, sure. A collection of candidates, uh, and they produced uh, ordinal ballots uh, without ties, and let, let's say for simplicity, without truncations. Sure. And you want to pick a single winner. And so uh, uh, you mentioned Kenneth Arrow, uh, but there's also a famous theorem of uh, Jabard and Sathathwati about uh, manipulating. Uh, uh, your ballot in the hopes that you could take advantage of the voting method. That's correct. So yeah. In, in it, traditional it, voting. Jabbar and Satterthwaite. I thought it was Gibbard Satterthwaite, but I guess I've never heard them pronounced before. I don't know how he pronounces <laughs> it. I've never heard him pronounce it. But uh, in, yes, well in any case, uh, two sort of uh, conflicting and important uh, methods are Condorcet, where you pick somebody who can beat everybody else in a two-way race, right. but often, not often, but sometimes, you sort of hinted at this, right? Uh, there aren't any, uh, there is no such uh, uh, candidate. Uh, and then you can use the, the border point count system. So Sari uh, doesn't like Condorcet methods, but it seems to me that uh, the natural way to, uh, um, if you think uh, your second choice on your ballot might have a chance of beating your first place choice if the board account is being used, you're going to link list that candidate at the bottom. So That's I don't. Correct. So I don't understand why he's so enthusiastic for the board account. Uh, well, it yeah, means so that it's going to be encourage people not to be honest about their ballot. Yeah, you mean strategic voting? That's what yeah, you mean. So, right? so, so let me let me let me give you the answer to that that I uh, that I give to my students uh, when we talk about this in a, in a course. My point of view on this is that you're always going to have trade offs, uh, and it's important to note. So, there's two things. One, when it comes to manipulation specifically. Every system, in fact, even this approval balloting under the correct formulation is susceptible to some kind of manipulation. It's not the same kind of manipulation, but there is a Satter Gibbard Satterthwaite type theorem even for approval voting. Um, so that's one thing is that, you know, just in principle, they're all susceptible. But more to the point, it's what are you really valuing in a voting system? So if you really value not having these kind of inconsistencies with respect to the Condorcet component, as, as you would say, then you would want to choose a border type method. If, you're, if your main concern is to really respect this pairwise outcome, the tournament graph of the thing, then you would not want to use a points-based system. So it's really, it, it's really more of a methodological, or even like a, you know, a hermeneutic almost, it's like, what's your worldview? Is your worldview that head-to-head -head voting is the most important thing? Or is your worldview that having some kind of compromise is the most important thing? And really, I can't resolve that, right? So it, it, board account is the least manipulable among all points-based systems or, or according to different definitions, but there's lots of really interesting experimental stuff. Um, they use something called Earhart polynomials to calculate volumes of various polyhedra. 
to compute exactly how often you might have these inconsistencies happening with various kinds of methods under certain probability assumptions. So there's a, there's a lot of voting theorists who really only want Condorcet consistent methods. Um, but Don really, he believes very strongly that if you have a system where it's equivalent to paying attention to these kind of, he calls them confused voters, then that says enough that the problem isn't your system, the problem is your criterion. Okay, well, I'm, not I'm unconvinced. That. I'm not gonna- I'm a big that. Condorcet fan. And uh, so let me just make two comments. One <laughs> is that uh, there's a method due to Duncan Black, who was sort of a pioneer in voting oh, yes, methods, I... that you use Condorcet. And if there is no Condorcet, you use Borda. And that, an uh, that makes a lot of sense because it uh, picks, uh, pe if there is somebody who can beat everybody else in a two-way race, you get that. And if there isn't, uh, it's very hard to manipulate. Uh, there are theorems that show that among all different methods, Black's method is very hard to manipulate. Uh, and then there's another method due to the Australian, uh, uh, his name is Baldwin. And he has a method where he conducts a runoff based on the board account. And you can prove that if there is a Condorcet winner, Baldwin elects that person, uh, but it has some... So I, in fact, I was never really quite able to figure out whether Sari believed in pure border or he re really believed in Baldwin. Because when Baldwin, uh, uh, if there is a Condorcet winner, Baldwin picks that person. I, I think that he would probably be against that. He, he, his statement is the Condorcet winner as a standard for the field is basically an error. I'm not sure I completely, so see my paper uh, on the permutahedron where I address some of these things where it's like, you can put in as much Condorcet winning as you want or you don't want in the kind of a spectrum of methods. Uh, but the reality is that all of these methods are complicated to explain to voters as well, including the so-called uh, ranked choice voting, which is more properly called instant runoff or hair, um, mm -hmm. which even now there's all kinds of people who are just completely baffled by how that works. And that's much more straightforward than any of these. Uh, so for political voting, now for other kinds of choice situations, you may not care about that as much. So if you're trying to choose a Netflix movie to watch, or if Netflix is trying to choose it for you, mm -hmm. then there may be completely different uh, axioms that would be appropriate. But I, I can't adjudicate this. this. This is a very long running and will continue to be a long running debate, no doubt, till the end of time. I, I agree. But uh, <laughs> actually, uh, it's not, you know, uh, there, there are. Well, sorry to interrupt. This, uh, can do better. this ends the former part of this uh, seminar. Robert, please stop recording. Thanks again. Thank you. But people are welcome.